Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with CloudTamer.io and High Metric. I'm Matt with uh, CloudTamer, and today's webinar focuses on four ways to automate cloud DevOps and, and the grunt work. Uh, we're going to kick off the main event here in just a minute, but just a couple items we'd like to cover first. Um, one kind of exciting here, uh, for every attendee for today's webinar, we'll be donating $10 to World Central Kitchen. World Central Kitchen is working across America to safely distribute nutritious meals uh, to those who need support. Um, they've actually served more than 19 million meals in over 300 cities in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So really happy to, uh, to do this on behalf of every attendee of today's webinar session. Uh, next, we hope you get a lot out of today's session, but more than anything else, we want to make sure that you really uh, take away those how-tos around the four ways to automate cloud DevOps. So we want to make sure that we cover those how-tos around speed provisioning, speed proper account setup, giving uh, the right access to users, as well as identifying and remedying uh, policies and compliance drifts. So again, just as a bit of an agenda of making sure that those are those how-tos we want to make sure uh, you take away from today. Uh, beyond that, like I mentioned up top, uh, we'll be taking uh, questions within the Zoom chat. So feel free to get any questions you have throughout today's webinar session. Uh, you can populate them there and we'll answer some there or even bring some forward to our open uh, Q&A at the end of today's session. Uh, we're also recording today's webinar and we'll make it available uh, later uh, to any attendees on this call as a resource. Uh, now, just before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to gauge what type of automation uh, is used today out in your cloud onboarding. So to do so, we're actually going to launch a quick poll. Um, so go ahead and take a few seconds. You should see the Zoom webinar poll now. Uh, take a few, few seconds and let us know sort of where you fall on our uh, official automation scale. I'll give you about five more seconds. Answers furiously coming in. <laughs> Three, two, one. All right, we'll close off the poll. Um, looks like uh, for the most part, uh, folks still doing a lot of grunt work. Um, it's 67% of the poll today uh, in that one to 25% uh, range. So definitely some, uh, some opportunity to onboard out there. Uh, great, to, great to know, uh, good to match to today's session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Mike Love, Director of Engineering for Hymetric, and Randy Shore, VP of Delivery and Support with CloudTamer.io. Uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. So uh, as Matt mentioned, we're gonna talk today about the kind of the ways to automate cloud DevOps and, and really end the grunt work. And I think kind of consistent with our poll, um, we see a lot of customers today that are doing a lot of manual processes, whether they be around um, DevOps type release, uh, release processes or whether they be specifically around cloud uh, automation. Um, we hear time and again how the cloud is touted as this cure-all uh, for digital pain points that's supposed to help with speed and agility and security. Um, and even innovation, but you know, without automation, uh, unlocking these features becomes nearly impossible. And customers really struggle to realize the value that, that is touted by cloud providers. Um, so manual effort really is the kryptonite to cloud value. It, it really slows down um, fulfillment of cloud requests, and it also adds a, a significant security risk to, um, to our cloud estate. So let's take the grunt work out of cloud DevOps. Let's, let's talk about some ways to automate some of these processes that you can do today um, that would really accelerate that fulfillment and that ability to deliver on, on the value of cloud. So automation of cloud provisioning um, accounts through service catalog tools like ServiceNow and BMC Digital Workplace and even Jira Service Desk can really help teams speed up uh, the creation of cloud accounts and subscriptions while ensuring a standardization of security baselines and, and really the appropriate approvals. And so um, by integrating with these service catalog tools and leveraging the workflow automation, we can help customers and we see customers time and again, provide a much better level of service to developers and to cloud operations folks who really wanna get access to, to cloud resources. 
So some of the keys to success when we make when we do this with customers and, and when we see this in, in the industry um, is first gathering as much information ahead of time as possible. Make sure that that request is gathering everything up front so you don't have a lot of email handoffs and constant uh, pinging for, for more detail and more content to, to fulfill the request. Make sure that fulfillment automation creates the account and creates triggers account setup tasks. So don't just think about how do I deploy a subscription in Azure or an account in AWS. Make sure we're also triggering account setup tasks, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit what those tasks might be. And then automate the approval mechanisms where possible. Um, so really try to think about how can I prevent manual approval that waits on a manager or manager of managers to interfere? Uh, can I have thresholds like maybe a budgetary level of a thousand or two thousand dollars a year that would just be automatically approved as a sandbox? Those types of activities really help customers accelerate that adoption and, and reach that value drop much quicker. Perfect. So uh, I think to, to kind of put that in practice, I'm going to steal the share here for you, Matt, or Mike, and uh, sorry, Matt and Mike, um, and take a look at, at kind of what this looks like here, uh, using something like ServiceNow, as you mentioned. And so um, you see here, you know, our, our end user, Abraham Lincoln, uh, decides to log into the service portal, um, because this is what they're used to coming to, right? This is where they get their access to different things. This is where they can um, put in tickets with your help desk, right? They can get servers or services done. Uh, but in addition to that, right, we're, we're taking and we're kind of sharing the same front door now to bring those cloud operations um, into a very simple to use form, right? And I think the, the point that you harped on around ensuring that you capture enough data up front to make smart decisions um, can be seen in a form like this, right? Where you're not just saying like, I want a new cloud account, um, you know, and they hit submit or whatever, right? You're grabbing information that can help you uh, understand where that, that cloud account may live, uh, what type of data may be uh, in, in use there and, and help you actually move into some of the other facets we're gonna talk around uh, security and compliance um, and policy, right? So putting in a, you know, a name for, for what they're, they're looking to do, like, you know, grunt work webinar, um, choosing uh, some sort of lifespan uh, associated with this project, whatever it may be. Um, talking about how much money they want as well, right? So it's not just about getting an account. Uh, everything in cloud obviously costs money. Uh, and being able to align that back to different budgets that may have been sent, set up uh, for them or potentially even create new budgets can all happen as part of this workflow, whether it's, uh, you know, as you said, Mike, if we can get down to, uh, you know, no approvals potentially for uh, internal workflows or uh, pre-approved budgets or something like that. Uh, or if there are approvals, be able to route those without having to put the burden on kind of that end user, right? So they can come in here and say that they need $15,000 uh, from, let's say, the IT department. Um, they themselves, right, Abraham Lincoln, are going to own this um, to do grunt work uh, in this webinar. Um, but critical pieces of information, such as having something like this, uh, this project OU. And so um, we'll get into a bit more around the importance of uh, organizational units within our tool, Cloud Teamer. Um, but really what, what, what I'm doing when I select something like this as a research here, um, this ties into the tool to really understand again where this where this uh, cloud workload fits in, right? So by choosing as my research, um, you know, I'm already kind of setting things within my organization within a certain subsection. Uh, I'm potentially defining my data as being uh, HIPAA classified, for example, health information be it by being part of an ASMA research study. Um, and so gathering all this information up front helps all of those teams make that smarter decision. Um, so, you know, it's just simply kind of set this up, check this out. And again, right, this could kick off the internal approvals if needed, or really uh, kind of this workflow that we're gonna come back to uh, later on here. Cool. So what's kind of next, right? What do we think about after, after automation? So one of the big things is giving the right access to users up front. Um, and this usually involves in integrations with existing identity tools. And, and setting up role-based access so that developers can do what they need to do in the cloud and support personnel can do what they need to do in the cloud, but making sure that there is no more access than that. So some of the, one of the big keys to success here is really taking a look at um, job function and aligning access profiles based on people's job function. So a lot of times when we work with CCOEs and cloud PMOs, um, we begin to define out these various roles, developer, support, 
administration, security team, um, even the finance teams and the FinOps teams. And when we determine based on what you need to do in the cloud, so for support, it might be logging in and validating that uh, EC2 instances are up or running. Uh, for finance, they might want to log in and view all subscriptions and see their budgets and, and how they're, uh, they're spending and what they're being invoiced for. We, we collect all this information. We begin to align cloud permissions and boundaries to those job functions to make sure that people have access to do their role, to do their job. And as we begin to expand and add more subscriptions, those subscriptions fit into the same model and same alignment as, as the, uh, the initial design. Um, Another big piece is associating these roles to groups within the directory service. So as, as new accounts are created or as um, roles are shifted or added to people's profile, this is as easy as dropping someone into a group within directory service instead of someone having to manually go in and configure uh, an, a, an access in AWS SSO, for example. And make sure this is incorporated into the provisioning process. Make sure we're defining those users, defining those roles, and defining those people and groups up front so that the provisioning process can take care of provisioning access to the cloud account that it's also creating. So Randy, you want to walk through this with folks? Yep, absolutely. So here's an example, right, of what's happening on the back end with our, our new request, right? So it goes through an approval mechanism and simply just by kind of closing that task, right, you kick off automation around your first bit here of identity. So um, within an organization, as, as Mike was just saying, right, you have kind of defined roles that could be um, added into, you know, every project maybe within a certain area of the organization. Um, or potentially uh, a standardized subset of roles that people can choose on that intake form. So that as you're doing that, you're defining actually all of the groups that get created on the back end um, to handle this going forward, right? Up front, uh, a user who has a new uh, need to move a workload to cloud likely doesn't know all of the developers that may end up on their account, right? So individually adding in and saying, um, you know, Mike and Randy and Matt all need to be in this group uh, isn't, isn't a great sustainable model, but having something that, that can tie back to uh, those roles or those groups within something like Active Directory, as you see here, where that same workflow, you know, not only provisions that new cloud account, but also provisions your, uh, your Active Directory groups, uh, starts populating that with members. So in, in this case, I know it was hard to see there uh, in this recording, but we actually added in both an administrators group and a developer. Uh, where our developer, we, we knew uh, Isabel Infrastructure is a developer within our as a research or biomedical research organization, added her into the developer group while adding the requester, Abraham Lincoln, as the project admin, right? So being able to standardize those roles uh, and, and be transparent in those roles as well. So you, a lot of organizations have, uh, you know, a confluence page or a knowledge article around the different roles that are available and what that means both within potentially a tool like CloudTamer, which we'll introduce here in a bit, um, or even, you know, more importantly, I'd say what, what that role can do once they get inside of the, the CSP's console or portal, right? Thanks, Mike. So um, we mentioned sort of at the beginning um, in the automated provisioning, um, speeding up proper account setup. And so after an account is provisioned uh, through your workflow automation tool and your service catalog tool, you also want to make sure that the account setup is automated to ensure that accounts are compliant uh, from the get-go and they're not being kind of still manually updated with the appropriate configuration uh, services that need to be activated. A lot of this involves uh, making sure that networking uh, infrastructure is automatically deployed based on our defined infrastructure, not based on either AWS or, or Azure's you know, default CAN networking stacks. Um, activating security services to make sure that they're scanning immediately when the account is, is activated and turned on instead of after someone you know, begins deploying uh, resources and workloads into that cloud account. The really important thing about you know, speeding up proper account setup is it also lets us make sure that people are focusing on their specialty. Uh, we don't expect developers to be able to figure out our network engineering uh, requirements and our networking stack and then go ahead and deploy that into a cloud account. Um, and vice versa, we shouldn't expect network engineers to go in and have to activate security services. Um, that should be kind of all defined up front, guardrailed up front, and then automated when the account is provisioned immediately. So this lets developers be developers and really let network engineers be network engineers. 
Um, it also prevents a nice solid foundation for them to build on because now we know that things are uh, consistent and, and, and adequate for, for the workloads that they're trying to build. So a couple of keys to success here, um, make sure you automate everything. Everything in the cloud can be automated, everything in the cloud should be automated, and so we should be taking that to uh, our, that approach to the account setup process. Um, make sure you standardize account architectures uh, and use CI CD pipelines, infrastructure as code, cloud native services to really plumb that account. Uh, automate guardrails and compliance by taking your accounts and aligning them to an organizational compliance mapping. So this is kind of important for the security concept to make sure that we know what our organizational structure looks like. We know how those uh, organizations have various compliance requirements and needs. And we wanna make sure that we are considering that when we're deploying these accounts so that those guardrails that are, are being identified based on the org model can be applied to the accounts um, as soon as they're activated. And then ensure the provisioning process is completed before it's turned over to a developer. The last thing we wanna do is have a developer get in there while an account is still being plumbed and set up. So make sure that all of these provisioning processes are completed and then give access to your developers so that they have a good foundation to build on. Kind of our final uh, point for, for taking the grunt work out of DevOps, Cloud DevOps is identify and re remedy policy and compliance scripts. So when cloud accounts are created, it's, it's important to note that we have the baseline configurations there, but that's just the start. Any account guardrail, even the infrastructure within those accounts really needs to be continuously monitored for compliance scripts. This helps us make sure that anything that is problematic or could become problematic is identified, remediated, or alerted on early before it becomes a huge problem. So a couple of keys to success here. Make sure that policies and compliance align to that existing org model. This is going to make it easier to report on things. It's going to be easier to make it make us allow you to understand when there's a problem and what that problem might be. And it's also going to make it easier for, for you to figure out who needs to be alerted and who should be contacted when something is detected. Make sure control boundaries are in place to restrict activity and reduce non-compliance within the account. Create a way to automate remediation or at least notification responses when compliance script is detected. Don't just have an email go out, but have a runbook or a plan that can be addressed when something needs to be fixed. And if possible, automate it. Leverage automation on the cloud, leverage automation from your uh, automation tools, to make sure that those holes and those compliance strip issues are remediated quickly. And finally, fiscal compliance is really just as important as security and governance compliance. Um, a lot of people forget about this or don't think about this, but security and governance really exists to protect the fiscal sanctity of an entity. And we wanna make sure that we're thinking about that from a, from a budget and from a cloud spend per perspective as well. And being able to automate compliance with those budgets and compliance with the, that spend control is a really a critical step to ensuring that we have a complete view and a completely protected cloud estate. Perfect, great. Yep. So um, here at Cloud Teamer, uh, we kind of think of this as our enterprise, our enterprise cloud lifecycle. So really bringing all of this together into kind of three main facets of of what we believe to be a good cloud governance strategy, uh, focusing around uh, kind of account management, budget enforcement, and uh, continuous compliance. So you know we've touched on on all of these kind of individually already, but you know that that full account lifecycle from from the uh, kind of beginning to end, right? Starting with provisioning, which which we've obviously been harping uh, harping on here a bit, um, but also ensuring that uh, at the end of it, your your customers or your end users um, or your developers, right? Are getting uh, access to that newly created cloud account um, ready to go 
inside of that, inside of the, the uh, CSP themselves, AWS, Azure, GCP, whatever it may be, um, with uh, kind of proper guardrails in place, both from a fiscal perspective, so setting up uh, and aligning with those cloud budgets, right? So if we think back to that uh, form that I filled out in ServiceNow where I asked kind of what department would be funding this, uh, how much uh, money will you need? How long do you do you expect this workload to, to be running in there, for example? Um, and that really allows you to start tracking against uh, against that budget to understand, you know, how you're how you're doing uh, financially, um, putting in enforcement to ensure that you don't go uh, over budget, um, as well as, of course, as as Mike was just saying, um, moving into uh, both you know fiscal compliance as well as your security compliance. Right, there is more to uh, compliance than that just initial provisioning of the account turning on you know, guard duty or whatever it might be, um, enabling config, right? You also need to be able to continuously monitor what is your compliance posture? Do you have any drift, uh, for example? And so uh, with that, I wanted to kind of switch over and give you a little bit of a demo as to uh, what that looks like in practice here from, uh, from Cloud Tamer. Um, so looking back here, uh, we see you know, this approval or this, uh, this process that we did in ServiceNow has actually in turn resulted in kind of this full end-to-end -end automation, right? We, um, we in turn actually went out to uh, David Liu in this case, who runs kind of the IT department in this environment to say, hey, you know, can we actually have $15,000 of this budget? Uh, and then uh, there was kind of the administrator approval before we fulfilled this request and delivered it to the customer. And, and what this looks like on the other side, right, to a customer is now they have this new project inside of, of the tool that we're looking at here, which is Cloud Tamer. Um, so what, what we're looking at within Cloud Tamer is kind of a policy view uh, of our organizational chart here. This org chart is a representation of, uh, of an organization here that has kind of, you know, a company Y has uh, a number of different business units around marketing, research and development um, within our biomedical research organization and within asthma research, which is the, again, piece of information that I grabbed up front. I was then able to kind of automatically begin to set up certain policies on this new project that got created. Um, we see here from the policy view, right, I've got uh, cloud rules in place. Um, cloud rules are a cloud teamer concept, but are uh, really designed to kind of set up um, set up and provision accounts using native cloud functions like uh, infrastructure as code languages like cloud formation or, or um, arm templating for, for the Azure side. Uh, we're putting in guardrails around what services and regions they can use. And you see, you know, we've even got, um, when we get into the Azure research side, we're even deploying kind of our, our HIPAA approved network into this particular project here. And so if we actually click into this project, we can get a lot more information about it uh, and understand where this came from. So we see uh, kind of the lifespan of the project is through the end of the year. Uh, we had asked for that $15,000, which had gotten approved and passed in from a fiscal perspective. Uh, we got you know, our description to know where this came from. Um, on the financial side, uh, in addition to having our, our budget, right, we've actually dug in and, and created a, a funding source or a budget line item that we can track back to that initial request in our tool, right? So we have accountability throughout the whole process where we can track back and say, how did this workflow come to be? Who approved this, right? This rec number, this REQ, uh, is the request number that relates back to ServiceNow, right? Uh, we can see the department that's funding it is IT. Uh, and as part of that, we actually created a fresh new uh, AWS account here called Gruntwork Webinar based on the name of my project. Um, that we've set here uh, and attached to this project, right? And so looking into our cloud management a bit, we've got our HIPAA approved networking that shares out a secure VPC um, in here. Uh, it sets up our, our uh, restrictions on what services we can use under, um, under uh, HIPAA, again, a health information compliance program here. And we've restricted this to uh, non-US regions, which is kind of a, a uh, or we've restricted non-US regions, which is a corporate policy that we have here uh, that we inherited kind of all the way from the top of our organization. And so uh, the last bit of this, right, is really, you know, what does this look like to an end user? And so when we come in here and we say, okay, you know, Abraham Lincoln um, is going to log in, uh, to this, right? He was the one that put in the initial request. He logs in with his Active Directory username and password. He sees the other uh, projects that are available to him, as well as uh, this grunt work project, which should be in here. I should have should have favorited it <laughs> uh, or searched it. Oops, sorry. Um, so within this project, right, he sees kind of the same thing here. 
But what's nice is that when he clicks into this account access, which uh, within Cloud Tamer kind of falls within our identity and access management, he sees this newly created account that got created for him. And he sees that he already has what we call a cloud access role. Again, having defined roles up front allowed us to say, okay, you know, when a new project gets created, a project administrator role gets, gets added based on that user logging into active direct you know logging in with the same active directory credentials they're in this group that allows them to actually federate natively into the aws console utilizing that same role right and so they're in here as a project admin uh, we can see who's logging into this fresh new account uh, within here right if we're kind of inside of ec2 for example um, we can see that uh, there's Nothing currently running in here. However, we could go ahead and launch an instance. However, we have all of our different controls in place, right? So I can come in here into, let's say, Canada um, and try switching out of uh, out of kind of our corporate compliance policy, uh, of which case you see I've got kind of dashes here. If I come into running instances, I'm not even going to have any uh, any ability to uh, actually run anything within this region uh, because I'm kind of outside of the US, right? Uh, if I were to go in and look at my VPC, that's been shared out with me in that. Uh, and so all of my baseline infrastructure has been in place here. I can only use uh, approved services under HIPAA, approved regions that are available to me. Um, but most importantly, right, we're actually still making sure that a number of other enforcements are here. So from an enforcement's perspective, we can see that um, not only did we set a budget, this budget actually inherited from its parent OU here at the asthma research level. Uh, where we can actually set an enforcement to happen that can take action based on a different threshold. So for example, right, setting a $15,000 budget, uh, in this case, if the entire ASM Research OU spends more than $1,500 in a month, we're actually going to take action where not only are we, going to, are we going to notify certain individuals of this happening, um, we're actually going to put on a, a cloud rule. So again, another cloud automation uh, function here that can turn off EC2 instances off hours um, across the across the board here right so we can begin to ensure that this budget is is um, being adhered to and of course abraham lincoln kind of being the the owner of this grunt work project uh, can come in here and they can actually layer on their own enforcements as well so if abe says you know that's great that you said this at 1500 you're going to do this um, i want to know actually when my spends at let's say 500 dollars this month uh, I'm going to trigger an overburn, which will inform me that something has been happening. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, you know, find myself in this list here and make sure that I get an email about this, uh, for example, right? And they can uh, trigger a number of other things that are associated with that. Um, so really where this all comes together, right? You have your fiscal compliance in place. You have your, your security posture set up. You have your network shared out. You have your end user access provisioned under a particular role. Um, but really that, that notion of kind of continuous compliance here is uh, incredibly important. And so we have this, this uh, built-in compliance engine into Cloud Tamer. Um, again, obviously I'm gonna be partial to saying you can do this in Cloud Tamer, but um, you know, there are a number of other compliance tools out there uh, that are open sourced if you're just getting started. Um, we think you know, our, our mission is kind of to make people's lives easier in the cloud. And, and we think that you know, by baking this into our product, we're in fact actually doing that. And so we see here that this particular project uh, has to uh, comply with one particular standard of HIPAA. Um, this HIPAA standard actually has 126 compliance checks on there. Uh, and we've already actually got a finding uh, against these checks. So we can see kind of our non-compliant check here um, is that we've got uh, guard duty it does not appear to be enabled in this account at the moment. And so we can actually come into this finding itself and we can see here that, you know, it's ensuring that guard duty is enabled. It's a medium severity uh, within this standard. And we can see the actual account where guard duty is not enabled. And we can see that, you know, within seconds of that account actually getting created, we already started scanning it uh, for its compliance here. Um, so with that, right, we could come in and we could actually view some metadata about it. We could federate into the console again, uh, so we can enable guard duty. Or, you know, as, as we just learned from Mike here, right, this really should have been automated at the beginning. This is a compliance posture to have guard duty enabled. Um, it's, it's associated with this HIPAA uh, standard. So let's add this into our provisioning scripts, uh, for example, and make that one more thing that, that happens out of the gate um, that we only have to write you know, as infrastructure as code once and any time a new uh, Asma research project were to get created, uh, that would automatically happen here. Um, so flipping back to our uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, sorry. Um, 
So flipping back here, right, we can take a look at, at really what happened. Um, so, you know, from an end to end process automation perspective, we see on the left side, the end user went into uh, kind of where they go to get all of their requests done at their organization at this point, whether it's a ServiceNow or Jira, Helix, ShareWell, a homegrown solution, right? They've essentially requested a new cloud workload. And through an approval, potentially, what we've done is we've reached out to two different APIs. One being AD to create those new groups that we saw, actually populate those with users. Um, the other being Cloud Tamer, which in turn actually created that new project. Um, use, use the AWS um, API kind of through our platform to create a fresh new AWS account. Um, attach that new funding source that we saw, that $15,000 funding source. Um, and again, simply by having that user, you know, basically choose that OU of Azure Research, all of the native kind of inheritance of, of Cloud Tamer kicked in. So those cloud rules kicked in to baseline infrastructure uh, or to deploy baseline infrastructure, set guardrails. Uh, those budget enforcements were set and those triggers were, were engaged there. Um, and then, you know, using you know, any flavor of, of identity, whether it's direct LDAP, which you saw me log in with, uh, or kind of any of these SSO providers, right? Uh, that would front end that Active Directory group that you just did, which in turn would provision um, Abraham Lincoln to get into that account as we just saw, for example. Um, so that's just, you know, one way of doing it and, and really just one way to kind of bring it all together. Um, but wanted to talk a little bit about Cloud Tamer. I've given, I've given you kind of a very brief demo of it. Um, but for those of you who have not heard of Cloud Tamer before, uh, as I said, we our kind of mission is to make people's lives easier in the cloud. And we do that by, by kind of being an enterprise governance solution, uh, really focused around all three major areas of cloud governance, as I pointed out before. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see here uh, in the bottom right, we have our, our uh, account management, budget enforcement, and our security and compliance um, here with, with kind of front ended through a single pane of glass, right? So we are not a, uh, we're not a SaaS solution. We install directly into uh, your AWS environment or your Azure environment uh, to give, you know, all levels of your organization, whether they're financial users uh, looking to kind of save money uh, or uh, security and compliance looking to reduce risk and set policy, um, or even just your end users kind of accessing those cloud accounts and getting into the consoles directly. Um, a, a single place to go uh, to bring all of that, all of that multi-cloud kind of operation to a single place. Um, so we'd be happy to, to kind of talk more about our solution and, and show this to you at any time. Um, I do wanna make sure that, that we leave time for questions here uh, about what we talked about today, um, but appreciate everybody uh, tuning in so far. Perfect. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate it. Let me take a peek at the chat here. Just a reminder, if you haven't already, you can submit your questions into the Zoom webinar chat um, so that our panelists can answer them. So uh, first question. Uh, thanks, gentlemen. A lot of information. Um, maybe something around the biggest lesson learned in these four areas or biggest challenge. I guess that's really for either of you. So. You want to start, Mike? Or I take that. Sure. So I think kind of the, I think the biggest message and I think the biggest lesson learned is automate everything. Um, that's going to be my sticking point. Make sure that everything is automated and that you have sort of figured out ways to automate things. So the approval example, um, make sure that you know, you've gotten the buy-in and that the threshold are okay and, and automate that approval process, for example. Automate the cloud account creation process. Just automate, 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 automate. Yep. Yeah, I think, uh, I think one of the biggest kind of lessons learned that I've seen working with customers here is to, uh, again, really figure out kind of what, what you want to set up ahead of time so that you can capture all of that data. Um, I think the, you know, the, the importance of having kind of standardized roles, um, understanding that, you know, when a, when a user selects, for example, as a research, um, not only are they, are they kind of getting a, uh, a catalog of items added into their account, um, they're also sort of setting up uh, a little bit of, you know, security policy, right? By being part of Azure Research, you're getting a HIPAA approved network, which in turn means that, you know, your data classification is going to be involved. Um, so it's trying to capture, uh, you know, what is the smallest piece of information that you may need from your end user uh, in order to make the smartest decision on kind of the other end of the process. So I'd say that um, that's kind of what I've seen from, from customers here. 
Perfect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that helps uh, answer that question. Uh, one more here. So trying to introduce more automation, but having issues, uh, what do I do and where can I start? Uh, I would say for, yeah. it's not directed towards one person, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that, that we see is uh, here at Cloud Tamer is really um, getting people involved, right? Getting everybody involved. A lot of people are uh, kind of against automation because they think, uh, you know, it could lead to their job going away or something like that. Um, we here at Cloud Tamer are just part of our kind of standard onboarding because we uh, focus on really these three facets of cloud governance. Um, we actually bring these people to the table often, often for the first time, right? Financial, uh, you, the, the, the FinOps team or the financial analyst or whatever they may be within your organization um, are likely kind of receiving the cloud bill today um, and maybe having some higher level discussions around, you know, how that aligns with cloud budgets, but they're not getting involved in uh, or having kind of control often in how that budget may get set. Uh, and what happens when you get to a certain threshold of the budget, right? Um, and so bringing kind of financial folks with security folks and uh, just kind of IT operations or DevOps folks together, you start realizing that, oh, you know, the DevOps team is capable of writing different scripts or lambdas or whatever they may be to, to take action on accounts. Well, the finance team is like, well, how come, you know, how are we blowing our budget then? And how come I'm only finding out about it uh, 15 days after the, the bills close and it gets mailed to me, right? Um, being able to bring them together and they start realizing that, you know, this automation isn't here to replace them. It is here to help them. Um, and I think that when we see those, those different roles come together and realize that everybody's in this, in this journey together, um, it helps, it helps immensely, not just uh, ensuring that you don't overspend in the cloud. Um, but I think, you know, when you do overspend, it's kind of the, it's the number one thing that halts all cloud adoption is when things go off the rails, right? And so it really benefits everybody to have more people at the table in, uh, ahead of time. Um, so involving them rather than trying to say, yeah, hey, you know, we know what you do on the back end with that bill, so we've automated it. Um, it just, when people feel involved, they, uh, they care a lot more. Yeah, um, I'll expand on that. So I think Randy had a good response on the culture side. Um, it's it's if you don't have the cultural change, then all of this is just not going to happen. Um, and we've seen that time and again. Um, I think I'll I'll take more of the technical path because you have to do both, right? You have to change culture and you have to do technical change. So on the technical side, I think it's a lot of uh, you start small. Don't boil the you know ocean. We've all heard that ten thousand times as engineers. Uh, but it's really important here not to try to build, automate every single thing in the chain. Um, start small. Is it just automating the, you know, guardrails on an account through Cloud Tamer or Control Tower or Blueprints? That's a great start. Um, then start expanding, okay, what's the next kind of most important thing or the next easiest thing maybe? Maybe the next easiest thing is to hook up your service now or your Jira service desk to call the automation to provision that account and add those guardrails. Okay, go do that next. Um, don't try to do too much in one leap. Uh, if you haven't done the culture change, you're gonna get pushback, but also you introduce a whole whirlwind of technical debt that might kill you down the line um, if you try to do too much too fast. Yeah, I think in that same, in that same vein, um, trying to find ways that you can uh, you can figure out kind of which tools in your stack need to be involved. So, you know, for example, in my diagram, I kind of showed how um, we created groups directly in AD and then that was inherited by our SAML provider by one login or, you know, ping or whatever it may be. Um, trying to understand what, what down, uh, what downstream automations may already exist will also then help you kind of crack the nut sooner um, and, and really start working, right? It, the whole idea of work smarter, not harder. If there's already an automation that that handles a bit of it, can you get in front of that automation um, so that way you kind of flow into that same stream uh, and get that same product out of it? So, um, yeah, I'd say that that's probably uh, my two cents on it. Nice. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I'm taking a peek at the chat here again. If you haven't had a chance to submit your question, now's the time. A look, no, it looks like we are all set on questions. Um, 
So thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar. We really hope you got a ton of value out of today's session. We'll leave uh, both Cloud Tamer and Highmetrics uh, contact information up here. So if you'd like to follow up with us, um, feel free to do so. And, and also if you're looking for uh, a recording of this session as a resource, we'll be able to provide that um, after the fact as well. Um, unless uh, Randy, Mike, any other thoughts, closing thoughts? I want to say thanks for, uh, thanks for taking some time today. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.